Welcome, everyone. So welcome to day three in our fifth session of the COA Summer Institute. It's been great so far, right? Really good. Um, I, was, I was struck by something Christian Rutt said yesterday morning about intelligences, tools, and interspecies communication. He noted that with machine learning and artificial intelligence, we might soon be able to communicate with other sentient beings like whales. Um, and then he appropriately asked about the ethical implications of crossing that boundary. Um, what if the boundary in question were intraspecies between different human communities? And that's one thing we'll explore today with Adam Goodhart and Ted Widmer, a question of exploration, ethics, and cultural contact in the Andaman Islands, one of the most isolated, least understood human communities on the planet. And I can tell even by the way I inflected the term most isolated that I'm guilty of a kind of fetishizing or at least romanticizing the concept. Um, and that's problematic, but I don't think I'm alone. Um, yesterday, uh, I said curiosity and our drive to understand the world was unique to humans. And I think Tom Klepek called me out on it yesterday in the right way. Um, but I will maintain that it may not be unique, but we have exceptionally strong muscles of curiosity. And that can be problematic when we flex them sometimes. Um, in trying to understand who the North Sentinelese are and what they are like, we run the risk of turning subjects into objects. We suffer from a kind of love of gazing where the act of looking can have a devastating consequence on those we look at. Adam Goodhart is a historian at Washington College in Maryland. He wrote an incredible piece in The American Scholar back in 2000, and he has a soon-to-be-published book coming out by Godin Press on the, the North Sentinelese. So he's had this 20-year vision. Um, his writing is exceptional. Uh, but not just because he is a, a great storyteller, but because he reflects on these ethical complications and he wonders aloud like how his own work might even contribute to them. I might ask a similar question, like what business do I have bringing these two white Americans up, no matter how cool and how brilliant they might be, to discuss the North Sentinelese without having them here? Well, we couldn't really invite or bring someone from North Sentinel Island here, and you'll learn why today. Uh, we had hopes to have Dr. Vishwajit Pandya here. Vishwajit is a really wonderful guy and a brilliant Indian anthropologist who arguably knows more about the Andaman Islanders than, than anyone else. But Vishwajit's visa didn't come through in time. We couldn't get him here. And honestly, having Dr. Pandya here wouldn't have, it would have been excellent, but it wouldn't have solved that, that kind of interesting question. But we thought it's more important to have the difficult, wonderfully difficult conversations. And we knew that Ted Widmer was the perfect person to engage in the conversation. Ted's been a part of the COA Summer Institute from the very beginning. Ted is director of the Humanities Lab at the City University of New York, was a speechwriter for former President Bill Clinton and Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton. He's co-founder of the W. Farrell Film Festival and author of an amazing book on Abraham Lincoln. He's also a wonderful friend. So I welcome Ted Widmer and Adam Goodhart. Thank you so much, Darren. If it helps, I'm slightly less white than I was yesterday after getting a sunburn on the college boat. Um, you'll be hearing from my solicitor later, Darren. Um, it's really wonderful to be back on this island in the dawnland of the Wabanaki, Wabanaki people and to be with so many very close friends. For me, friendship and the excitement of new ideas are intimately tied up in my experience and why I, I come back so often, in fact, every year since the second year of, of this institute. Um, 
I came, I think, in 2018 for the first time at the invitation of my, my good friends, Will and Jeannie Thorndike, and my circle of friendships has just expanded since then. It's just such a joy to, to be here. Um, and today's conversation is also uh, uh, the result of a, of a friendship of 20 years, at least, between me and Adam Goodhart. As Darren mentioned, he's written a, a beautiful and important book. Uh, he's holding a galley in his hand. It's titled The Last Island Discovery, Defiance, and the Most Elusive Tribe on Earth. It's about exploration and the, the human costs of exploration. And um, even though you can't buy it yet, you, you will be able to buy it very soon. And the accolades are already in and they're through the roof. Nathaniel Philbrick calls it a mesmerizing chronicle of a people at the frayed edge of a so-called civilization. Maya Jasanoff says, the last island has the elegance of a spiraling seashell. This beguiling book holds within it the echo of vast historical tides. Um, Adam's a, a very close friend. I feel I've known him even longer than I actually have known him because I was such a fan of his writing for so long. Before I met him, I was reading him in the National Geographic, in the New York Times, the Atlantic, Smithsonian, and especially in a magazine that no longer exists called Civilization, that was the official magazine of the Library of Congress where he was working in 1998 when this epic adventure began. Um, not too many years after that, I was able to find some money for a writer in residence at Washington College where I then worked. And Adam came out and accepted that fellowship and basically never left. It's kind of like how you must feel about me here at the College of the Atlantic. <laughs> um, he loved it. We loved him. We kept renewing. It was supposed to be a one-year fellowship. We just kept renewing it every year. I think he was the only holder of it in, the, in those years. And then I left for another job at Brown University, and he replaced me in my job. So we've just had a wonderful uh, kind of interrelated career for all these decades. We wrote books about the Civil War at, um, well, not quite the same time. His came out, his beautiful book, 1861, came out in 2011, and my Lincoln book came out nine years later, but I was much affected by the way he writes about history and how he puts himself into the story, and he's certainly done that with The Last Island. Um, and I just, after thanking COA, I want to thank National Geographic Society and, and magazine Adam's written many times for them, and, and parts of this book will be appearing in the November issue of National Geographic. And he's also participating in a documentary about North Sentinel Island, which you will be able to see next year. Is that right, Adam? Uh, later this year. OK. And I just want to briefly mention a, a personal connection through Maine history to the beginnings of the National Geographic Society. Gilbert Grosvenor, who really shaped the modern society, was born in Istanbul in 1875. And the reason he was there is his father was a history professor at an American college founded on the banks of the Bosphorus, about the same size as this campus, called Robert College. It still exists. And it was founded by a Maine educator who basically couldn't get a job in Maine. And so he founded a college very far away. And his name was Cyrus Hamlin. He was my great-great-grandfather. So uh, it's for that reason, in addition to all of these friendships, I'm so happy to be home among friends. So why North Sentinel Island? How did this journey begin? Well, first of all, I just wanted to thank you, Ted, for that lovely introduction. And um, thank you to Darren and Sean and everyone from College of the Atlantic and to all of you for joining us this morning. Um, this place, I had never been to Mount Desert Island before. Of course, I had um, heard the name, which sounds like a place invented by Robert Louis Stevenson or something, <laughs> Mount Desert Island. I mean, it's a name to conjure with. And it, it turns out that it's um, just as wonderful as it, as it sounds. It's this sort of island of magic. It's like Prospero's Island, but with lobster rolls, I guess. And <laughs> not only that, but I, I arrive here to find extremely um, friendly natives um, and friendly um, visitors, including old friends um, like Ted, old friends like 
here in the front row are Francis Steed Sellers, an incredible writer for the Washington Post who was my colleague at Civilization Magazine when I discovered the story of North Sentinel Island, um, and her mother-in-law, um, Lucy Bell Sellers, who is a longtime native of this um, island and who was my teacher in junior high school a legendary teacher at Germantown Friends. And so anyway, um, it's just great to be here. And it's been great to be part of the conversations um, that this week has, has entailed. Um, and listening to the other um, panelists throughout the week, um, there have been so many moments, whether we were dreaming about um, interstellar travel um, with Moriba Ja and Kim Stanley Robinson, um, or hearing about the New Caledonian Crows with Christian Rutz, um, so many moments that spoke to my own um, experiences and adventures and, and reflections um, with this place, North Sentinel Island, that's obsessed me and attracted me um, and in some ways um, occasionally horrified me um, for the past quarter century. So um, anyway, it's great to be here. And so your question, Ted, is why North Sentinel Island and what is and, North Sentinel Island? And can you Island? help us to find it first? Where, yes. where is it? And do you mind if people even look it up on their cell phone since, since okay. every place is findable? In I'll a way. make it even easier because I've put it right on screen. So you can see North Sentinel Island um, in front of you. And so North, and I'll show you a map in a, in a moment or two, but... Um, that's basically all of it. It's an island about 10 miles across. It's uh, just about the size, almost exactly the size of Manhattan. Um, it's in the Indian Ocean in the Bay of Bengal, and it belongs to the nation of India as an off-seas territory. Um, but when we say belongs, um, of course, that's, uh, that's a problematic, a deeply problematic um, concept for any piece of land um, because it's claimed... Um, by India as an offshore territory, um, but it, since time immemorial, has been the homeland of um, a, an indigenous people. Um, and these indigenous people are known to the outside world as the Sentinelese, um, but of course that's not what they call themselves. North Sentinel Island was a name bestowed by a British explorer in the late 18th century. Um, but this island is a place that um, nobody knows what it is called in the language of the people who actually live there. Um, because this is a place that in some ways um, shouldn't exist in the year 2023. Um, couldn't exist in the year 2023. It's terra incognita. This is a place, um, an island, where there is a tribe that is still, um, in most meaningful senses, and, uh, uncontacted although that's a problematic term as well that we can uh, come back to. Um, it's a group of human beings with no regular um, communication, direct communication um, with the outside world, although that's also um, a more complicated situation than it might seem. Um, and it's a group of people um, who have decided to live in complete isolation. Um, and in fact, to the point where when anyone tries to land on their shores, they will come out and they will make their intentions clear by um, fairly quickly shooting them with arrows. And that has happened um, repeatedly, as you'll, as you'll soon hear um, in recent years. So yeah, so this place, North Sentinel Island, in, in a way, is a place that, uh, that really shouldn't exist um, in 2023 in this world that seems to us often to be completely known, um, completely mapped. Um, photographed, um, written about, posted about, tweeted about, X'd about, whatever we're calling it this week. Um, but you may have actually heard about this place um, because about five years ago, it suddenly became world famous. Um, it became famous when a young American missionary named John Allen Chow landed there on this island that he called Satan's Last Stronghold. He wanted to convert the natives to Christianity, to his particular brand of American evangelical Christianity. He came with um, very intensive training that had, been, that had been provided to him by evangelical groups um, that have a very um, well-organized global um, mission to convert these um, uncontacted or, or at least unconverted um, peoples. Um, he bribed some local fishermen to carry him to the lagoon near North Sentinel Island. Um, he had a folding canoe with him, which he unfolded, and he paddled to the beach. He was carrying some fresh fish that he had caught and carrying a waterproof Bible. Um, he got to the beach, and he announced, um, my name is John Chow. I love you. Jesus loves you. Jesus sent me to bring his word to you. Here are some fish. 
and he started distributing these fish. Um, the islanders were um, fairly unimpressed with this, um, and they came out and um, they started sort of curiously um, looking at him, um, talking to him a little bit in their own language, um, and he kept uh, preaching to them. Um, finally, they began um, sort of gesturing towards him in a hostile way. They, they drew their bows and arrows. Uh, he retreated to his kayak. He paddled back to the fishing boat um, that had brought him to the island. Um, and the next day, he decided to come back. So he came back a second time. We know all of this because he kept a diary. And the diary um, was actually shared with um, the, the press by his family um, a couple of weeks later. So. Um, he came back to the island, and this time he took out his waterproof Bible, and he began reading. Now, why he thought that reading from the Bible in English to a group of Sentinelese would do any good, I don't know, but he started with the first chapter of Genesis, started reading the book. Um, a young boy, young Sentinelese boy, came up to him, um, took his bow and arrow, and held it up at point-blank range, and fired it, but instead of firing directly at this young American himself, um, he actually fired into the waterproof Bible. So it hit the waterproof Bible. It penetrated to the book of Isaiah, chapter 63, verse 5. <laughs> Chow later recorded in his diary. Of course, I went and looked this up, and the verse is, I cried out for help, but there was none to hear me. <laughs> so Chow once again beats a hasty retreat. Um, and he decided to go back for a third time. And, you know, there's so many things with North Sentinel Island that kind of read like or sound like a fairy tale. And one is these sort of three visits that he made to the island. And so um, the last diary entry that we have from him, he was um, sitting on this um, fishing boat before dawn, um, getting ready to go for the third time to North Sentinel Island. And um, he had a strong premonition of his, his death. And he... Um, knew that if he went back there that he might not um, return. He also knew that by going to North Sentinel Island, he might be bringing um, diseases to the Sentinelese that could endanger them. But he wrote in his diary about how it was um, essential for him to do this, if there was any hope for them to be dancing um, together someday around the throne of Jesus, that he had to return and, and convert them. He had a vision where he beheld a sort of a vast um, glowing city um, hovering over the island it almost reminded me of like something between like um, Star Trek and John Winthrop City on a Hill vision in New England. Um, and then he returned to this um, island and um, a few hours later the fishermen circled back and saw the natives um, dragging his lifeless body across the beach and, and burying it in the sand and they had apparently killed him with their bows and arrows. Um, so as you can see, um, this made headlines all over the world. And so suddenly, um, this uh, native tribe, this group of, of just a few dozen people, nobody knows exactly how many um, Sentinelese there are, um, suddenly they became world famous. So here you can see um, where North Sentinel Island is. It's in the Andaman Islands, and you can see in the inset that it's in the Bay of Bengal, sort of strung between um, Burma and Sumatra. And so how did there come to be this, this place um, in the world where um, it's still completely out of touch um, with the rest of the, of the planet? Because it's really, it's a bit off the beaten path, but it's not that far off the beaten path. In fact, um, somewhat surreally, it's quite close to um, centers with um, hundreds of thousands of people. It's a couple dozen miles away from um, places where there are um, ecotourism resorts with honeymooners um, snorkeling in the lagoon. It's actually a few miles away from a 5G undersea um, high-speed um, um, digital data line coming in. So actually the cell coverage on North Sentinel Island is probably pretty good, <laughs> even though they don't know it. Um, but it also ended up um, sort of isolated. So. It's, it it uh, is not a place that uh, is undiscovered. It was um, mapped already by the British in the um, 18th century, as you can see on this map um, here. Um, it, the uh, Andaman Islands were colonized by the British in the 19th century, and, and um, I may talk a little bit later about this um, very, very white, white man whom you see 
here surrounded by native Andamanese um, on one of the other um, islands. And this, uh, this part of the world was, was really, um, um, it, uh, it almost could have been invented by, by Joseph Conrad as a kind of a, um, a heart of imperial darkness in many ways, a place where some of the worst um, atrocities and, and excesses of the British Empire um, played themselves out. Um, but this one island um, was um, not actually occupied by the British, um, nor was it occupied by um, independent India after the British left. Um, as recently as 1975, the very first photographs of them um, were taken, and um, the story of photography and its role with um, colonization and, and imperialism and, and genocide is interwoven with the story of, the, of this island and of the Andaman Islands. Um, National Geographic um, actually um, sent a photographer, a journalist there with an Indian film crew who were attempting to um, shoot a documentary called Man in Search of Man. Um, they managed to capture these images of the Sentinelese on the beach, but moments after these photos were taken, um, the film director was actually shot through the thigh with an arrow um, by the warrior whom you see um, on the left. So they had already begun to gain um, a small measure of, of fame for being um, fierce and, and isolated even before 2018. In the 1980s and 1990s, the Indian government um, began staging a series of contact missions there. That anthropologist on the left, um, Dr. T. N. Pandit, um, a man whom I came to know very well um, on, my, um, on my journey to the Andaman Islands in 1998, um, managed to make a number of, of trips to the waters off North Sentinel um, by boat. Um, by handing uh, bananas and coconuts um, to the islanders. First, they would just sort of float them in the, in the water, and the islanders would, would come and collect them from a safe distance. Eventually, they got to the point where they were able to interact in this sort of friendly way where the natives would come up and accept um, the gifts from the um, anthropologists. And so there was this degree, at least, of minimal contact that was established um, with the rest of the world. Um, and then... Uh, uh, finally, in 2004, um, there was an encounter when shortly after the Indian Ocean tsunami of 2004, the Indian Coast Guard sent a helicopter over the island to check and see if the natives um, were doing okay, and the Sentinelese responded by coming out with their bows and arrows, and this, a, a, a picture was taken of this warrior aiming his bow Incredible at photograph. the helicopter, and the picture actually um, went, uh, it sort of went viral, and so the Sentinelese were in 2004, kind of an early internet sensation as well. Um, but then finally, um, after this encounter in 2018, they really um, became a kind of a, a global internet sensation and, and became um, a meme, um, although they, they didn't know it at the time. They don't know quite how famous they are. They don't know that um, Justin Lin, the director of the Fast and Furious franchise of movies, is actually um, starting to shoot a, a Hollywood feature about them and about the John Allen Chow um, murder this fall. Um, and you can see that they have been picked up on um, all over the, the internet, all over so social media for these memes um, where they're seen as the world's greatest practitioners of digital detox um, or seen as being the um, champions of social isolation and social distancing during COVID, um, or seen um, hailed by people on the right wing um, for their closed border policies and their, um, their resistance to multiculturalism. So anyway, that's uh, a long answer to your short, short question, Ted, of, of sort of what this island is and who these people are. Well, thank you. That helps us a lot to locate it. Um, but I'm struck by an, another question, which is more personal, which is a small number of people have become obsessed with North Sentinel. It, it is a special place. And we might say John Chow had a, had a very unhealthy obsession with it. But 20 years before that, you were already in that category. With all due respect, you, you formed an obsession in 1998. You've, and you've used words like viral which brings us into the age of the internet. If I don't think that's even a phrase we use, but it, your beginning to look into this includes the very beginnings of the internet. So how did you stumble across this, this topic, and how did you do your early research? 
So I became fascinated with this place when I was a, a foolish young journalist um, in my 20s, um, living in Washington, D.C., and I was always a, a kid who um, dreamed of travel and exploration. Um, I always wanted to um, write for places like National Geographic. Um, I always wanted to um, um, travel to, to unexplored parts of the, of the world. Um, and uh, in fact, in, in many ways, when um, I have learned more about the life of John Allen Chow, the young American who was killed on the island, even though um, he was an evangelical Christian and I have not, there are some uncomfortable um, echoes uh, in um, his life story with mine, the kinds of books that he loved, books like um, C.S. Lewis's Voyage of the Dawn Treader, um, was one of his favorite books. It was one of my favorite books um, as well. So um, I was living in Washington, D.C. I was working for um, a small magazine, um, and I came across this island late one night. I remember I stayed in the office. I was researching something else, and so this was the early days of the Internet, which itself feels like a sort of a terra incognita um, today. It's hard for me even to imagine what it felt like to be surfing the web in the World Wide Web, as we sort of idealistically called it in 1998. Um, but I was there doing this um, web surfing, doing this form of um, exploration that each of us undertakes now um, that's come to feel it's so, mu it's so emblematic to the experience of, of our culture today, um, kind of going down a rabbit hole as we call it, when we start uh, Googling one thing, even though Google didn't exist yet, but I was looking in LexisNexis, I think, for one thing, and then that took me to another and to another, and suddenly I was reading an obscure anthropological journal that was talking about this Indian anthropologist, Dr. Pandit, who had been making attempts to contact The, the one um, in the people, photo, in the, the water. The one in the photograph, yeah. Um, who had been making attempts to contact this people um, on an island in the Andaman Islands and mentioned that this was thought to be the last uncontacted people in the world. Um, and I thought, my gosh, I can't believe this is happening right now in 1998, right before the end of the millennium. And surely there's a story here about um, where we are at this moment in the history of our planet. And it's something that I need to write about and it's something that uh, I need to see with my own eyes. So. Many of us can relate to that. We're curious. We love to read about the world. But few of us would actually go to the edge of North Sentinel Island. And you did. So can yeah. you tell us about that trip? I How did. How did you even get there? Yeah, I did. So um, in 1998, that involved um, flying to India, um, going to Calcutta, what's now called Kolkata, uh, boarding a steamboat and traveling um, for six days across the Bay of Bengal um, by steamboat getting to Port Blair, which was this um, sort of what, what felt like it was still um, a 19th century colonial outpost, the capital of the Andaman Islands, um, was founded by the British in the 1850s actually as a, as a penal colony. Um, and today is this, the administrative capital of this offshore territory of India. Um, and then I found some local fishermen and I basically bribed these local fishermen to take me under cover of darkness. We so went again, before like dawn. Chow. Yeah, a lot like Chow. In fact, I, I suspect that Chow actually um, based his trip on mine because there was this account that I had written that was available on huh. the internet that was basically the only account around of how to get to North Sentinel Island. And so I, I bribed these local fishermen and you see them here. We were in this um, tiny boat with an eight horsepower inboard motor, um, and we went under cover of darkness because the Indian Navy patrols the waters around North Sentinel to keep anyone from trying to do what, uh, exactly what we were doing and exactly what Chow did. Um, and we um, circled the reef, and we actually saw the natives coming down to the beach um, holding their bows and arrows um, and spears. And one of them actually even went, got into a dugout canoe. They have dugout canoes that, that they use to fish in the lagoon. Um, they can't actually travel across the open ocean, but they go out into the lagoon. And so we saw a man in his canoe in the um, lagoon. And we had this um, encounter that felt like it was an encounter across the, across the millennia, across cultures with this hunter-gatherer people who very much didn't want us there. It was a um, moment that was profoundly um, moving and, and, of course, incredibly memor memorable and exciting and, and also a very problematic um, moment. And I question myself a lot and I question the role that I and that journey that I made may have played even in drawing John right. Chow there and drawing the eyes of the world to this place. So the book is incredible to read 
I've read the galley um, not only because you bring the reader to this um, very remote location, dangerous location, but then you go backwards in time. You do a huge amount of research in, in India and in, in Britain and sort of bring us back to an island that we've actually known about far longer than we've known about North or South America. I mean, it, it, it was not exactly unknown. It was known to Marco Polo, and you have a, um, a Ptolemaic map at the front of your book showing it. And so how, how was the research experience? Yeah, I, so I, as a historian, I'm, I'm really both a, a historian and a travel writer, and so as a historian, I was, I was pulled into understanding where this place is situated, um, not just um, geographically, but also in the geography of, of history, um, in the geography of, of time. And so it turns out that this place, the Andaman Islands, really as far back as, as Greek and Roman times, um, was kind of viewed in Western culture almost as, as emblematic of um, a kind of a, a savagery, um, a kind of uh, uh, um, mystery and evil and darkness and all of those things that, that quote-unquote, Western civilization um, associates um, with, uh, with indigenous people all too, all too often. Um, in some of the earliest maps, like this is a map um, that's from the 1400s, but based on a map of the Roman geographer um, Claudius Ptolemy, it, the Andaman Islands are actually labeled, all of these islands are inhabited by anthropophagi, or inhabited by cannibals. Um, so they had a reputation for being cannibals, um, for being headhunters. Now, that's completely untrue. Um, it's perhaps understandable that the, that the uh, native Andamanese might be mistaken by casual visitors um, for cannibals because they have a somewhat disconcerting um, habit of wearing the bones of their deceased relatives around their necks. Um, and it's their way of, of honoring the dead and keeping um, the dead with them. They actually will um, allow the, the flesh to be stripped from um, a corpse um, by, by insects, and then they'll gather up the bones, and then you'll be sort of wearing grandma's skull around your, around your neck, um, especially on ritual occasions. But they were, they were not cannibals. Um, they were not headhunters. In fact, ironically, the only people who are known to have practiced cannibalism and headhunting in the Andaman Islands are the British, are the supposedly civilized European colonists, because um, we know that on at least one occasion when um, some Englishmen were shipwrecked in the Andaman Islands, they ended up um, committing cannibalism. And we also know um, more disturbingly that as recently as the 1920s and 1930s, when the British would stage um, so-called punitive expeditions against members of the indigenous Andamanese um, groups who had trespassed in one way or another on the colonial settlements, sometimes these expeditions would return with the heads of Andamanese men, women, and children as, as trophies. Um, and there are accounts of the British who basically um, were hunting um, these people as if they were hunting for, for sport. Um, they wrote about their, their pleasure in pursuing these people who combined all of the, um, the, the guile um, of tigers with the skill and cunning of human beings. You have a photo of a wife wearing her husband's skull, and she looks sort of happy about how things turned out. Um. <laughs> you'd, have, you, you'd have to ask her. Yeah. <laughs> so in your research, you, you also found it, it's not, I and mean, what I'm trying to say is there was a high degree of knowledge in the 19th century, which is a, a century you and I both love to wander in, and you found um, amazing photographs, not quite of North Sentinel, but of other peoples living very nearby. And can you tell us about Portman and how you found him? So it turns out, not surprisingly, you know, it's it's not an accident um, that these people live on their on their island and um, shoot anyone who tries to to land because they um, clearly have um, all too strong a historical sense of what's happened in the past um, when when people. Um, have made contact from the outside uh, with the uh, with the indigenous tribes of their of their islands, um, and clearly they have all sorts of historical um, memory that they are drawing upon. And we um, can 
um, infer what happened um, through the historical record and through knowing what happened um, with some of the encounters that the um, British and, and others had with other indigenous groups um, in the islands. And so um, it turns out, you know, most groups, um, in fact, today, many, many uh, anthropologists are kind of avoiding the term uncontacted tribes and preferring the term um, groups in voluntary isolation. Um, because these are groups that really um, have made it clear their foreign policy is they do not want to be disturbed. They do not want to be invaded for very good reason. Um, and the reason has to do with past experiences like some of the ones that I discovered in delving into the records and in finding um, every single account that I could find of every um, contact, no matter how fleeting and glancing, um, that this island had had with um, outsiders and in finding the whole um, dark and, and twisted and Conradian history of the British Empire um, in, in the Andaman Islands. So stories like um, in 1857, and you're looking at a, at a lithograph that shows the first British expedition um, to settle the Andaman Islands as a penal colony. The Great Mutiny had just happened in British India, and they needed somewhere to send um, the rebellious sepoys from the East India Company army. And so they decided to um, colonize the Andaman Islands. And this British expedition went, um, you see their steamer, which was named the Pluto, um, an inauspicious name. There are so many things in this story that are sort of um, almost scripted by a novelist. So this, this steamship that's named after the god of death um, arrived and they um, um, had an encounter with the natives. And you can see on the right the natives um, in their canoes putting out into the lagoon um, to meet the British and the um, Indians from the subcontinent who are arriving. Um, a military clash happened where several Andamanese um, were killed and one young Andamanese was kidnapped and brought aboard the British vessel. Um, he was given um, the, uh, a, a sailor suit to wear and he was taken back to Calcutta to meet the Viceroy of India and Lady Canning, the um, Viceroy's wife, and I actually um, in London found letters in which Lady Canning wrote to Queen Victoria at Buckingham Palace describing her interactions with this, this kidnapped Andamanese um, who, was, who was named Jack. Um, and Jack was, was sort of dressed up in, in a sailor suit and taken around and sort of made a pet of. Um, he quickly grew, uh, grew sick, and as soon as he grew sick, the British had sort of second thoughts about keeping him, and so they took him back to his island and left him on the beach again. Of course, um, we can only guess that he may have brought um, whatever disease killed him and spread it um, to, the, uh, to the members of his own, of his own people. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I found all of these images, um, the images that, that just fascinated me of these Andaman Islanders in contact with Europeans, in contact with the outside world um, over the past 150 years in various ways. So this, is, uh, this I found in a photo album in an archive in Calcutta, and um, it's captioned, Mrs. Ford's Wedding Party. It's a very mysterious image, and so you see all of these white people and then two dark-skinned anemones um, in the front. Oh. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, it seems to, I seem to not have this image, but there was one particular photographer um, whom I became very interested in, Morris Vidal Portman, um, who was a young Indian, um, a young uh, Englishman, um, a young aristocrat who went out to participate in the Indian colonial um, administration in the 1870s and became sort of obsessed with these native people and became obsessed um, with getting... Oh. Here we go. Um, he became obsessed with these, with these native people and with capturing them um, on film and ended up um, taking hundreds and hundreds of photographs of the islanders from surrounding tribes. He tried repeatedly to land on North Sentinel Island and get pictures of those native people. Um, he had uh, only limited success, um, but he did take incredible, um, stirring and beautiful and deeply disturbing, many of them, images of other Andamanese. Um, 
he arrived at a moment when the population of these um, indigenous people was, was plummeting due to diseases and due to military clashes and due to outright genocide. Um, he decided that he was going to try to save these people on, on film, as it were, rather than trying to actually save them from genocide. Um, he captured them photographically. Um, and I found these images in the British um, Library, the British Museum, and in an archive in Calcutta. Images that are sort of aestheticized, images that are kind of disturbingly um, framed in 19th century race science. This is a map that he made. He tried, he, he landed repeatedly on North Sentinel Island um, and tried repeatedly to uh, befriend, as he said, the inhabitants. Uh, on one occasion, he managed to capture several of the islanders. It's the only record we have of the islanders actually leaving North Sentinel Island. Um, there were um, four children and an old man and an old woman whom Portman took with him back to the main British settlement. And the old man and the old woman both grew sick and died. Um, and he brought the children back to the island and dropped them off. And once again, we can only guess that they may have spread diseases um, with them. Oh, there, this is the picture that I was looking for. And so that is Morris Vidal Portman seated there at the center, surrounded by islanders. And I mean, talk about creepy. This is maybe one of the spookiest colonial images. I mean, he sort of makes like Kurtz from Heart of Darkness look like Mr. Rogers. It's sort of a um, really, really scary image. Um, this is a photograph that he took of North Sentinel Island, of the trees on North Sentinel Island on one of his attempts to land there. Um, and this is a photograph that he actually staged. He brought islanders um, from one of the other islands to North Sentinel and had them pose pretending to be members of the Sentinelese tribe, um, hiding among the roots of this tree. I also found um, his previously unidentified diaries at the British Library in London, um, an incredibly exciting um, moment that brought me inside this sort of twisted world of sex and drugs and science. Um, that, uh, that, that was the story of his interactions with these natives, which is a story I delve into in the book. And um, this is one of the um, negatives that I found in the British Museum um, of his photographs of the Andamanese. We, we should, I think, open up the conversation yeah. to the audience soon, but um, are there ways to imagine a good end to this story? I mean, it's difficult to think about North Sentinel Island surviving uncontacted for much longer. As you say, there's a huge internet cable passing underwater very near to it. Um, but it would be nice to try to imagine a, a good end. And, and I don't mean end, but next, next chapter. And can you also tell us about your, you went back, you went back in 2020, and a lot of things had changed, not, not for the better. So can you bring us up to date, and then we'd love to hear your, your questions. I, I went back in 2020, and um, I, was, I was there just sort of weeks before the, the whole world um, shut down with COVID-19, um, which fortunately, as far as we can tell, did not reach North Sentinel Island and did not have a serious impact among the other um, indigenous Andamanese um, tribes. Um, I did um, get to see, I, I did not go back to North Sentinel Island itself. I very much did not want to repeat um, that, that experience. Um, but I did have some contact uh, with the Jarawa people. And the Jarawa are members of another indigenous group um, that uh, actually had just begun to make um, their first sustained contacts um, sustained contacts with the outside world when I was there in 1998. I saw members of a previously um, isolated Jarawa group um, emerging from their native jungle um, and to make contact with people from um, the surrounding um, primarily Indian um, population. And so here you see two um, Jarawa, Jarawa women, this is not a photograph that I took, but two Jarawa women, women um, on a road um, that goes through their, their tribal reserve area. And, you know, when I saw these Jarawa coming out of the jungle in 1998, um, I sort of imagined the worst happening for them. I imagined that they might soon be ravaged by diseases, um, by uh, completely out of control um, contacts with um, all that modernity has to, has to offer. Um, 
It turns out that the Jarawa have actually managed to negotiate for themselves a kind of a middle way. Um, they've managed to remain um, in their hunter-gatherer lifestyle um, while also having limited contacts with the outside world and especially um, benefiting from um, modern medicine. Um, so mm -hmm. if you're a hunter-gatherer um, Jarawa and you're in the jungle and you get bitten by a snake, you know that you can go to one of the Indian government um, medical clinics and get medical care. And so they've managed to ne negotiate um, their own sort of uneasy uh, and perhaps um, we'll have to see how long it lasts, but uh, truce um, with the outside world. We have to see whether the Sentinelese are able to do the same or not. Well, thank you. Um, are there questions from the, yes, sir, in the back. Has any um, uh, neuroscience um, analysis from a, from a chromosome, um, a, has, it, has any mapping been done, ne neurological mapping to, and, and any work done on the, the um, differences from their their uh, chromosomes and ours. Yeah, it's a the I, the the question of the genetic relationship between these people and the rest of of humanity is a really interesting and important one. You can see they look very different um, from people from um, the Indian subcontinent. Um, they look um, very different from most people from that part of the of the world. They're very dark skinned. They're very small. They look. Um, in some ways more stereotypically what we might think of as, as African um, than, than Asian. Um, and it's not known. They're, they're part of a, of a group of peoples who are known to anthropologists as Negrito, although this term is sort of being somewhat um, phased out for its uh, problematic, um, problematic overtones. Um, but this group of peoples um, who are thought to possibly relate to a um, foundational population um, of South Asia that goes back um, at least 50,000 years. Um, they uh, are not known to have any linguistic relationship um, with any other group, so they've been isolated for a very, very, very long time. Um, genetically, they seem to be closest related to Aboriginal Australians, um, but there's been very little work done, um, in part because uh, there, there simply aren't um, many samples of Andamanese um, DNA available, and um, there are all kinds of issues of consent um, that are raised by by working um, with Andamanese um, DNA. Um, there are a few uh, there are a few geneticists um, who are starting to um, study them, and there's some interesting work being done um, right now by an by a uh, geneticist um, at Harvard. Um, who is looking into the genetic history of the Andamanese. But um, in short, they're, they're still uh, a mystery in many ways. Is any of that being done by David Sinclair? Um, no, as far as I know, David Sinclair is not involved, no. Nick Patterson from, uh, from Harvard um, is the person who is working on this. Yes. Yeah, Mariba. Yeah. Um, oops, wow. Uh, this is really awesome in what you've uh, shown, and I've kind of been tracking some of the stuff in media on North Sentinel Island for some time. And, you know, as you were, um, you know, showing and describing all these things, and in fact, uh, also your, you know, interactions um, when you went out there, it very briefly, it reminded me of um, a story of this photographer, Stephen Lyon, who I know quite well. And, um, you know, he, uh, he went out to Africa and... Um, he, was, he, he really wanted to photograph this rhino, and um, he spent two weeks just out in the bush trying to get as close as he could, little by little, and eventually the rhino, uh, I guess, allowed him to come close enough um, to get a really awesome picture. But four days later, uh, he found the rhino decimated, literally, mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. poachers. And so um, as we think about exploration and reimagining exploration, uh, the theme of, of, I guess, this summer's institute. I guess, who knows really in which way he might have contributed to the rhino, the same way in which you posit uh, that somehow maybe you could have contributed to uh, what happened to this missionary. And so um, as we, we'll never know for sure, right? But as we reimagine exploration, um, if we define risk as the likelihood of something occurring uh, and the consequence, uh, assuming that that does occur, what are your thoughts 
about how we might reimagine exploration and, and focus efforts on, I guess, really trying to be rigorous about the unintended consequences of what we do, yeah. no matter how unlikely that we seem to think that might be. Well, I, um, as, as uh, Darren um, mentioned, um, we had hoped that Vishwajit Pandya um, would join us, who is an anthropologist who has worked um, in the Andaman Islands since the 1980s and really is the only living person who has spent time living among members of another Andamanese indigenous group, and he, he understands and, and cares deeply about them. And he advocates for a policy that he calls um, eyes on, hands off. Um, and so basically, he says, you know, we have technology now that, that lets us um, keep an eye on people. There is surveillance technology. Now, of course, that's highly problematic, of course, when you're thinking about issues of, of consent. Um, and, um, but we can, to some degree, um, surveil these people, as was done in 2004 when the tsunami hit and the Indian Coast Guard sent a helicopter just to see if everybody was okay. Um, so perhaps that's um, the best policy now, but you know, it's, it's difficult because um, I think most people's uh, response when they hear about the Sentinelese is, well, of course we have to com leave these people completely alone. Um, we can't interfere. Um, we have to just make sure that the Indian Navy keeps um, patrolling around those shores and making sure that nobody lands. But it's possible to imagine um, tragic scenarios that arise through non-involvement and non-interference, um, especially um, considering that there might be another nat natural disaster like the tsunami, and perhaps um, those people couldn't be couldn't be rescued if they're out of out of touch with the rest of the world. Um, there could be um, some kind of um, incursion that brought germs that brought a pandemic to the shores of North Sentinel Island, and perhaps um, without benefit of of our medical technology, they wouldn't be able to be saved. So, it's very difficult to say what we should do because there are so many outcomes that we could imagine um, that could be it's bad. A paradox. We're, we're bringing. Oh, this isn't working. We're bringing uh, diseases, and we're also bringing the medicines that cure the diseases. Yeah. And history, of course, is always written in, in retrospect, and we, we look back, and if there was a bad outcome, then we say, of course, the wrong choices were made. Um, but perhaps the right choices were made, and there was still a bad outcome. But one big change in your two visits, 1998 and 2020, was direct air service to Port Blair. Yeah. And you talk about that, and just huge numbers of people, including tourists, and tourists play a very complicated role in this story. They're yeah. not really helping, right. but they bring revenues to the Andaman Islands, so it's hard to stop. And only this morning I read an article about Yosemite and how you can't, it's, it's not working. Can you hear me now? No. Sean, if you... Thank you. I just was saying. Yep. <laughs> I think a third mic might help. <laughs> Maybe I can just say it to you and you can repeat it. Yeah. How about this one? No. No? Oh, there we go. There we go. Um, the Guardian had an article about Yosemite Park, and the title was, Are We Loving Our Parks to Death? And I think the same question could be asked of Acadia. Are there just too many people coming in? And they want to come in because it's not like where they live. It's isolated, and you can walk down a beautiful path in the woods. But we need careful management of these wild places. So are we loving the Andamans too much right now? Um, you know, I think there there is um, there is clearly a great human impulse to um, to explore um, and to reach out to other people to see new new places. And it's not something that uh, exploration, I think, is not simply an artifact of um, Western culture. Um, exploration is not simply an artifact of imperialism. Exploration is something that's a universal human instinct. In fact, it's it's evident in the Andaman Islands. When I was there. In 1998, I met um, a Jarawa teenager named Enme, and Enme um, was a um, boy who actually had been, um, actually was the sort of 
envoy of his people um, to the outside world. Um, he was accompanying a group of older Jarawa um, warriors on a nighttime raid into the outskirts of the Indian settlements where they would go and, and kill livestock and um, snatch pots and pans and things that they could make uh, metal arrowheads out of. Um, and he tripped over a tree root and broke his leg um, and was found two days later um, under this tree by the local villagers, um, sort of whimpering in, in pain and, and, and fear. Um, he was taken to the hospital in Port Blair and he was given um, medical treatment. Um, and in the course of staying for a few months in Port Blair, um, he began to become accustomed to um, modern ways, to sleeping in a hospital bed, to eating um, junk food, to watching TV. Um, and when I met him, he was wearing like a Chicago Bulls t-shirt and a baseball cap. Um, and uh, he was a young man who was himself, a, he went, then he went back to, they, they dropped him back in the jungle. His, his people were overjoyed to see him again because they thought that he um, had, been, had been killed. And he became a sort of a leader bringing other groups of Jarawa out, as I saw when I was there, um, to make contact with people from the Indian um, settlements. Well, Enme, in his own way, was an explorer. And um, Vishwajit Pandya, the anthropologist, actually collected some drawings that en Enme made. And this is one of them that I just put on screen that shows his adventures and his experiences. And um, you can see the road that goes through his settlement, and you can see the bus um, that goes um, along, along the road. Um, and there's another one where he actually depicts the hospital um, and the hospital beds and the, and the doctors and the, and the nurses. And so Enme himself um, is, a, is a Jarawa explorer. And he actually, when I went back to the Enman Islands um, in, uh, uh, in 2020, and of course he um, would be in his 40s now, and I was very curious to know what had happened to Enme, and so I was, I was concerned about his survival, of course, um, but I also wondered whether, um, you know, he might have, have sort of completely embraced um, the, uh, the modern uh, 21st century. I mean, instead I learned that he um, had gone back into the jungle, um, decided he wanted to be a hunter-gatherer again, um, married a girl from his own tribe, and was living in a remote part um, of the Andaman Forest, um, and basically was never seen by outsiders. Um, no longer wears his Chicago Bulls um, t-shirt, but is a, is a hunter-gatherer in the forest again. But, uh, but he too um, was an explorer, is an explorer. We'd love other questions, but I may have the only microphone at this point. Um, Oh, you have, okay. I have one. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, this is fascinating. You, you've talked some about disease and modern medicine, but there's a lot of other impacts that the modern world is having on the island, whether we like it or not. Um, I, I've been reading lately about the discovery of microplastics in the most remote reaches of the ocean and the depths of the Indian Ocean. And I'm, I'm curious about other impacts that either you directly observed or that we know about just because, you know, because they're endemic around the world, such as plastic pollution and things like yeah. that, and how it might be impacting um, the, the tribe. Thank you for that great question. In fact, if you put the slides back on for a second, I can show you. Um, this is an image of the beach um, on Little Andaman Island, which is quite close to North Sentinel Island, and um, which is the home to another indigenous group, the, the Onge, that is um, in touch with, uh, with, the outside, with the outside world. And as you can see, there's just um, tons, literally tons and tons of, of plastic um, debris washing up on the beaches of this island. We have every reason to think that it would be the same on North Sentinel Island. And so this idea of a place that's, that's uncontacted is, is really a, a myth in many respects because they are living with the artifacts of our civilization every day. We even know that they are making use of these artifacts. Um, Vishwajit Pandya, the anthropologist, has actually um, observed them in, in one of his visits to the waters off North Sentinel Island. He saw that they had taken a blue plastic tarp that had washed up onto the beach and used it um, to make a little lean-to hut. Um, and so <clears throat> our, our civilization is encroaching on their island. Of course, um, also the um, habitat loss um, from um, reef destruction um, and from climate change is having an impact on their hunter-gatherer lifestyle. So the, the idea that they can continue, even if um, this, this island is perfectly, even if their isolation is perfectly policed, the idea that they can continue to live in sort of pristine isolation 
um, is really just a self-consoling fantasy. And really, ultimately, I think, um, you know, we are, uh, the rest of the world is very invested in the idea and the fantasy of a place like North Sentinel Island existing, because as long as there is this undiscovered island, this uncontacted people, um, it inhabits, as, as Wallace um, Stegner said about the wilderness in our national parks, it's an important place in our geography of hope. Um, so part of the geography of hope is the idea that there are still wild places in the world, there are still uncontacted people in the world, but I think it's, uh, I think it's, still, it, it's, it's already a fantasy. Can, can you t show us the previous image? It's so powerful. Oh, again, it seems to have gotten partly cut off, but that's uh, an image of a, of a man working to install the um, undersea um, high-speed data line that was being put in to Little Andaman Island when I was there in 2020. Any, uh, yes, ma'am. So, um, is this working? Yeah, I was fortunate enough to go to the village of Kwamala with the Tirio Indians, with, with uh, ethnobotanist Mark Plotkin, very shortly after contact. And um, what happened subsequently is that you know, the government was trying to take over their land. And, and there's another group called From Andes to the Amazon. And the government is trying to take over their land. So I have two questions. One is, why has there not been an effort to get the natural resources on the island, or like, are there none? Because it's, that's what's happened with all these other places. And if that were to happen, um, I know with, in the Amazon, they've given these native people the technology to map their own, their territory, and actually put in the legal documents that give them the rights to those, those places. And has, is there any group that's actually, even without their knowledge, help having them legally have rights to that island? Yeah, so um, there don't appear to be any um, natural resources on the island that would have tempted um, outsiders to come in, fortunately for the, for the islanders, and that's really the, the case um, in much of the Andaman Islands, um, at least, well, there, there are actually, there are some resources that, that, might, that might draw people in, but certainly nothing in terms of, of gold or oil or anything, or anything like that. Um, so that's probably why they were left uncolonized for as long as they, as they have been. Um, there are some um, really uh, important and, and impressive international um, organizations like Survival International um, that are involved in um, protecting the rights of indigenous people around the world and very much have um, the Andamanese um, on, their, on their radar um, and advocate for stronger protections um, from the Indian government. Um, it, these people, of course, they're, they are uh, officially, although they don't know it, um, they are citizens of the nation of India. Um, India is, of course, a nation with over a billion people, the largest nation now um, in the world. Um, the uh, current Indian government um, is, of course, a, a Hindu nationalist um, government that um, does not look very kindly um, on um, non-Hindu people, um, including the native Andaman Islanders. And so, in fact, the, the Modi government has been doing a lot that's been rolling back the environmental and cultural protections um, in the Andaman Islands. And there's a lot to worry about there. But there are um, international organizations that have their eyes on the situation. And the, oh, yeah, Tim. I'm, uh, you're, you, you touched on this a little bit, but I, I'm curious about um, modern civilization as an attractive nuisance. So one of the, the most disturbing image you showed us, I thought, was that modern image of the two girls on the street. And I know that um, Andaman Islanders are drawn out onto the roads, and I suspect this photo was taken in that way. Uh, the girls dress up and come out and are paid to have their photo taken. Mm -hmm. And um, so obviously that has an impact on the culture. But my question is how we view that, because it's much less problematic if they have a bow and arrow and they're saying, don't come. Mm -hmm. But simply by being there and by being nearby, we could have a very corrosive effect. And I'm just curious how you would, what, what you think about, I mean, it could be inescapable, but what do you think about that situation? Yeah, it's, um, so, so the, uh, the Andamanese, the, the Jarawa, um, 
do come out to that road, and I saw them there. There's a road called the Endman Trunk Road that goes through their tribal reserve area, and cars and buses aren't allowed to stop along the road. And actually, the Indian um, authorities do a pretty good job of making sure that tourists don't actually stop and sort of take pictures and, and interact, um, which was going on a lot in the early years when they started coming out of the of the forest. And so um, it's really policed pretty carefully to make sure that, that tourists um, don't do that. But then you do have to you know, ask questions about the, the rights and the autonomy of the Jarawa themselves. And you know, there's no reason to think that people who are members of um, an indigenous hunter-gatherer group don't have the same kind of diverse personalities and ambitions and aspirations within their communities that, that we do. Um, there are Jarawa um, who are excited to have those kinds of contacts, and there are Jarawa who want nothing to do with the rest of the world. And so how can we um, protect the autonomy um, and the independence of that community while also respecting the rights of individuals to make their own decisions about the degree of contact that they might want to have? It's a, it's a very, very tricky question to which there are no easy answers. And some could argue that, that the rights of the Jarawa, um, or indeed even the rights of the Sentinelese, are being infringed um, by sort of hemming them in. I think we have a question in, in oh, okay, sorry, Sean. And then we see one back there. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I have a quick question about your new book. Is there anything in that book that will help readers develop an anti-colonialism mindset similar to how Kendi has helped us develop an anti-racist mindset. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, I hope the entire book um, is, a, is a strong argument against a, colonial, a colonialist um, mindset and both the kind of colonialism that manifests in the um, British Empire as I, as I chronicled and also uh, more modern or postmodern forms of, of colonialism. So I think when you read the book, you'll see that that's very much what the soul of this book is. Thank you for the question. And uh, there's another question in the back. Oh, no. We do have time for one more, if anyone. Looks like this gentleman's hands up again. It's, um, it hits me uh, very deep in my soul. Um, this discussion, and um, I have, um, um, I'm switching to Yosemite, um, and I, one of our, our problems is understanding what we don't know. Um, wisdom is really knowing what you don't know. Uh, we know a lot of stuff. And this, this, this brings out your work, um, brings out <laughs> to me anyway, that the fact that we have um, lots to learn. And um, you, somebody bringing that up brings a, a, a thing to me. Um, it's the most, over three million people see Yosemite every year. Uh, and many more see it through other mediums, but um, they see it's 1,129 square miles. It's the size of Rhode Island, and they see a very small percentage. And, and this discussion sits in the same place. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Sean, I think that ends the, the event, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yep, we can wrap up. Thank you for your wonderful questions. We will be around to talk afterwards and look forward to seeing you at five. Owen. And Thank you. Thank you, Adam and Ted. Thank you. That, um, I had a chance to read the book and it is wonderful, and I think it addresses all that a really difficult topic in a really thoughtful, thoughtful way that touches on some of the questions that Beth had. I'm struck by the fact that I had my own kind of similar experience as a young graduate student in anthropology. I had the opportunity to go to the northern Amazon 
um, to work with the, the Zoe, which were a previously uncontacted tribe right on the border of Suriname, but the FUNAI, which is the Brazilian Indian Protection Agency, said no, right? And I was not allowed to, um, and I, I didn't pursue it clandestinely, which was a, a good thing, but so I have this per personal connection to the, the same kind of feeling that, that you went through, uh, Adam, and it, um, I thought you addressed it really, really well. So thank you both. And tonight we're switching gears because at five we'll have Jill Tiefenthaler and Lee Berger. Um, we're gonna be talking about Homo naledi and the discoveries of the Rising Star Cave system in South Africa. So that begins at five. I look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you. Thank you.